Good morning. My name is Kaeja Rodriguez, and I want to welcome you all to the FCCS Child Abuse Prevention Breakfast. And please continue to enjoy the buffet and your breakfast while we get started. So I was a proud Jack Donahue scholarship winner back in 2018 after I graduated from Fort Hayes High School. The Donahue scholarships were developed in 1996 to honor former Deputy Executive Director Jack Donahue. Mr. Donahue, like me, also grew up in the child welfare system and knew the struggles our children face and overcome. I personally want to thank Children's Services and my mentors who believed in me and invest in my future. I used the Jack Donahue Scholarship to complete my undergraduate program at Ohio University. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. And the funding helped me do so much. During college, I joined social service organizations. I was able to start my own business startup and even help develop and pass a law for former foster youth facing housing insecurity. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I earned my bachelor's degree in political science, and now I'm enrolled as a graduate student pursuing my master's in business administration with a focus in entrepreneurship. Thank you. I am so proud of and excited for this year's nominees. When I was asked to welcome you all, I thought, what would I have wanted someone to tell me back in 2018 when I was in your shoes? And I just want all of you, the nominees of the scholarships this year, to understand how powerful your story is. You have all had to overcome so much to be standing where you are today. And understand that your story is not a disadvantage. It is what will open more doors for you than you can ever imagine. And it's what makes you strong, and it's the reason that you have the power to achieve everything that I have and much, much, much more. Be proud of that fact, and I wish each and all of you all of the luck and success in the world. I can't wait to see who wins the scholarships this year, and thank you so much. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Executive Director of Children's Services, Mr. Chip Spinning. Awesome job. <clears throat> Good morning. Welcome to our 2024 Franklin County Children's Services Child Abuse Prevention Breakfast. Please join me in celebrating and really honoring this amazing young woman who just introduced me. <clears throat> Kaiji, your story is inspiring. It's an example of why we do what we do at Franklin County Children's Services, and I know everybody in this room is cheering together for your continued success. I appreciate the theme of this Child Abuse Prevention Month this year, building a hopeful future together. In the role of protecting children, you realize early on that there's no one single agency, no one individual caseworker, no lone government organization or program. No one alone can do this work without the support of the entire community around them. Just as we know that strong families are the first foundation of keeping children safe, we also know that families are better when they're in communities that rally around them and support them so that they can succeed. And today, the idea that we must build a hopeful future together has never seemed more important. Think about how different our lives were. Our city, how our world feels just four or five years ago before we use words like pandemic. And then you add the mental health crisis gripping so many of our young people, the stressors of violence and guns in our neighborhoods, and the uncertainties of the economy and the workforce. And the child welfare safety net is getting stretched thin and trying to keep young people from slipping deeper into the cracks. Whew, it's a lot. But if you're a numbers person, we have numbers too. The data shows that 28,000 calls and reports were made to Franklin County Ch Children's Services Child Abuse Hotline last year alone. More than half of those came related to concerns of abuse, one in six related to concerns of sex abuse, one in seven raised concerns of drugs and substance use, and one in eight reported children in a home where domestic violence between parents had shattered the sense of security that all children deserve. I repeat my whew, it's a lot. Still, in spite of these growing and changing challenges, and the belief, I believe that we can make this community come together and make a difference in keeping children safer and families stronger for longer. 
And the framework of the call to action is clear to us at Franklin County Children's Services. It's built around six key themes that drive our work. And there's a copy on the centerpiece around your tables that will give you a colorful representation of that work. And it begins with the simple recognition that children are safer. It requires us to have a not a just a one-size-fits-all solution. It requires an integrated strategy that emphasizes the whole child, protecting the body, the mind, and the heart. And finally, recognizing that mental health and social-emotional challenges confronting so many of our youth today. Secondly, we're committed to strengthening all families. We know that children are best served when they remain with their primary families as they seek support. So let's put our resources back into the communities and the neighborhoods and prevention programs that can keep any family from coming into the child welfare system in the first place. Third, it's about our team, FCCS culture. And it's how we keep our dedicated caseworkers and our staff safer and supported together. And that how we invest in training and creating a culture of safety built on respect, value, and a calling to service. Fourth, we want to be good financial stewards. And to me, that means reinvesting our tax dollars into businesses based in Franklin County and services provided by service providers that are more reflective of the children and families that we serve. And fifth is about relationships. Along with engaging our community and promoting an ecosystem of community partnerships that wraps around our families, no matter the size, the income, or the neighborhood, or the background. And finally, it's about leadership and innovation. I commit to you that Franklin County Children's Services will continue to be a champion in transformation of the child welfare system in Central Ohio and beyond. Looks like my time might be up, which we're getting close. <laughs> but, uh, but pushing our systems to do better and keeping families safer and kids in their families for longer. Again, it's a lot. Uh, but no single agency or no organization can do this alone. So I hope that everyone in this room sees their call to action for all of us. This morning, we will hear some inspiring stories from youth who we've served that are moving on to greater futures, from some families who we've supported that are stronger than ever before, and from some of our staff and community partners who are dedicated to this mission. And by the end of this event, I'm guessing that there will be a few tears shed and a few hearts warmed. But most of all, I want you to walk away with your call to this charge, that we can keep children safer and we can build hopeful futures for every family in Franklin County if we're ready to build it together. So thank you. Now it's my honor to introduce two gentlemen uh, who I know stand ready to build just in the moment. In a moment, you'll hear from our vice chair, uh, Elon Sims. But first, we're going to hear a message from President uh, Commissioner Boyce. Kevin Boyce, President of the Franklin County Board of Commissioners. When I think of what it means to build a hopeful future together, I'm reminded of the power that each of us have in ensuring that every family has a chance to be successful in this great community. And while we know that concerns about child abuse and neglect continue to challenge our community with more than 500 calls on average a week to our child abuse hotline, we also know that we, when we come together as a community to uplift our families, that's when we are at our best in ensuring that resources are connected with families and families are positioned to be successful. Congratulations to the teens and the families that are being recognized here today. Your stories are all of our stories and remind us of the power of determination, collaboration, and most importantly, love. We recognize and thank our caseworkers, community partners, and all of you for ensuring that the embodiment of the mission to protect children and strengthen our families is the foundation of our great community. Thank you so much for being here. Congratulations to all of you and have a great breakfast. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. All right. Well, it's good to see you all. On behalf of the Children's Services Board, I want to thank all of you for joining us for our 2024 Child Abuse Prevention Breakfast. So thank you all for joining us. Give yourselves a round of applause. 
today we are truly building a hopeful future together as a community. Let me first pause and acknowledge uh, my fellow board members, some in attendance today. If you all can please stand, Wilson and uh, Reverend Bean. I see you all in the room. Anybody else? Let's give them a round of applause for serving alongside us. As Director Spending mentioned earlier, our efforts to keep kids safer, make families stronger, is a responsibility we all share. For everyone here and those who are watching on Facebook Live, your presence reinforces our belief that we are stronger and more hopeful when we all work together and support all families. Uh, for those who are on the FCCS team, can you all please stand? Who all who work at FCC, FCCS? Everyone who works there. I just want to share, share that uh, as someone who started my own career at the agency a long time ago, uh, I stand with you and the work that you all get a chance to, to do every day. And so just know that you are, we are, you are valued and that we appreciate you all on your, on your efforts in protecting families each and every day. So thank you all for the work that you do. And we look forward to celebrating our students today and families as well. Thank you all. Well, good morning. I'm Scott Varner. I'm the uh, head of communications and community engagement for Franklin County Children's Services. Thank you all for being here. You know, um, today I look out and our entire community glows blue as part of Wear Blue Day. Um, if you haven't noticed, it started on Sunday night for the first time. Our office building was awash in blue lights, sending a very enlightening message to all those drivers who pass by on I-70. And then this week, the entire week, the Levesque Tower downtown, Columbus City Hall, the Broad Street Bridge, the Workers' Comp Building, and the Franklin County Government Tower are also all glowing blue um, to help spread this message. Um, and as I said this morning, so many of you are glowing blue, wearing blue as part of our statewide initiative with our friends at PCSAO, um, where um, people all across the state who care about child safety are wearing blue. And we're encouraging everybody to take your picture at some point today, post it online with the hashtag OhioWearsBlue2024. They are collecting all of those great images. Okay, so amongst all this blue, it's my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Amy Acton. I'm probably someone who uh, truly knows the power of community coming together. Whether as director of the Ohio Department of Health during the early days of the COVID pandemic, or as vice president of humankind at the Columbus Foundation, Dr. Acton has worked to create community conditions that truly empower all people to flourish and realize their full potential. She most recently used her unique ability to inspire people to live their best lives by creating a new nonprofit to champion Rapid Five, a movement dedicated to connecting Central Ohioans to nature and to one another through Central Ohio's five major waterways and the parks and trails along them. Her Health, Healing, and Hope series, The Loneliness Epidemic, produced by WKYC in Cleveland, has received the prestigious Gracie Award and is nominated for an Emmy. And now Dr. Acton, yes. And now Dr. Acton is featured in the PBS docu-series, The Invisible Shield, which explores the crucial role public health plays in our life expectancy. She is truly a friend to Children's Services and is a true example of how we can build a hopeful future together. Please welcome Dr. Amy Acton. So kind. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, good morning. <laughs> and uh, hi. <laughs> and hi to everyone on Facebook as well. You know, uh, it is such an honor to be here. Um, Miss Rodriguez, I'm not sure where she went. You know, uh, hi. <laughs> it was such a heartwarming story. And you know, this was a harder than usual thinking about speaking for me. I, I talk a lot about the pandemic. I'll touch on it a little bit here. Uh, but this is much closer to home for me um, because it was in uh, my service that I first, at my age, almost 60, learned to use my voice and my story, uh, which is something I had not done most of my life. Um, somewhere early on, I had learned that how I grew up made people uncomfortable, so I didn't talk about it. 
Um, and I, I was very fortunate. So I'll share a little of that too. Um, so our themes today are in this together, if you remember that from the early days of the pandemic. And just a little backstory on that. You know, you might have remembered the Not All Heroes Wear Capes. And that actually, the background of that <laughs> T-shirt being made um, was Ryan Vessler, the owner of Homage Apparel here in Columbus, uh, very early in March 2020, just when you were first mostly getting to know me, if you didn't know me here locally, was um, he, he called me up and said, you know, I want to do something to help as a business, and you're trending. And trending was completely lost, as my kids would tell you. Uh, I can't work the TV remote, and I've never once tweeted, or whatever it's called now, in, in my life yet. <laughs> so it was lost on me, and he thought, you know, I'd like to do a Dr. Amy t-shirt to support youth homelessness, because right before I got called out of the blue by a governor I did not know, um, I was working very hard on helping a lot of our organizations row together. Uh, land a big uh, youth uh, demonstration project grant um, and, and kind of try to make the next leap on that topic. And it's something I experienced as a child. So, you know, he said this will all, all the proceeds will go to it. And I said, you know, Dr. Amy T-shirt's going to be good for like two weeks, three weeks. <laughs> um, but before this pandemic is over, y you're going to meet so many heroes like this is more of a relay race where we're going to be passing that baton from one person to the next person, and that's truly what did happen. There's not a person here who is unscathed from what we went through. There's not a leader at any level, whether you were leading your business or a parent at home trying to figure it out, um, a school superintendent or a teacher, and certainly those of you who are on the front line of helping children who just didn't have to lead and just solve problems they'd never solved. And so he, that's when he came up with the theme, Not All Heroes Wear Capes. It went all over the world, raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and that was just the beginning of an experience I had that felt a lot like post 9-11, for those of you who remember. There was about four days where you did not know a stranger in the street. It felt like the whole world shared in something. And this feeling in Ohio, I can tell you, lasted about six, it lasted longer. And I want to tell you more about that. But my story is, you know, when I first met the governor, I went in, everybody stood up, everyone sat down. He then proceeded to pull out this crumpled paper bag and start eating his lunch. <laughs> and he carries this brown paper bag everywhere he goes, like Fran packs his lunch. And there's something so disarming about meeting a governor, but him just being like very, you know, low key. And only question he asked me was, tell me how you grew up, tell me where you grew up, tell me about your childhood. And for whatever reason, I was just very honest. I was not looking for a job. I didn't think it was a job. I thought I was going to get to plug a lot of the issues I'm passionate about and kind of just give him ideas. Uh, got so excited at one point that I literally like grabbed his arm because I'm a doctor and I used my hands a lot. I, the New York Times talked a lot about my emphatic hand gestures. So I grabbed the governor by the arm and I'm like telling him something and everyone gasped in the room. <laughs> and I went, I literally reprimanded myself out loud. I said, oh my God, do not touch the governor. <laughs> So this was my auspicious beginning, um, but I did, I told him about, you know, I grew up on the north side of Youngstown, uh, moved, you know, ended up in California, moved all these places, but or always end up back there, you know, at least 18 different places I can remember, um, physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, my brother and I really went through a lot. Um, many, many times came, reported, you know, found in a van, in the cold, ultimately living in March um, in a tent at a campground um, when I was finally removed from that, that situation. And I was 12 years old at the time. And um, I remember so much that the kids who were just as nice and just as smart as me, literally I was moved one mile away to Liberty Township. So the school that I stayed in for the rest of my, like, middle school and high school, 
But being in that steady situation, being in a school that had a lot to offer, my life just went a completely different trajectory. And, and, and so I often thought about the people who were left behind. Um, I almost felt like I was just lucky in this way. It got bad enough that I was finally removed. And um, back then, the people could just leave the state boundaries and, and be off the hook, even though by the time I finally spoke and used my voice, there were 11 other children that had come forward. That So, you know, that was the beginning. I, I did everything I could. I wanted to go to the six-year BSMD program. I was very much about achieving um, things that saved me were reading books in the library. I'd read, I'd take home, I, at one point we were in a basement, like all the time, not allowed out, like a, not a fixed up basement, but a dark, scary basement. And, but I had a book every day and it taught me that there were worlds, um, different ways of living. Um, nature was another big one for me and we all learned to love that in the pandemic. That's why I'm so passionate about it. But there were just these things and also people who didn't look the other way. Um, people who would see us walking to school and offer us lunch or breakfast or something to eat. Um, I also remember the people who did look at me funny. It's something, and again, I know there are a lot of people in this room who have shared this experience of, you know, parents who didn't want their kids to play with you because you maybe smell bad or looked funny. Um, so all those memories about not looking the other way very much fueled my career, which took me to the Bronx during the crack cocaine epidemic for my residency at Albert Einstein. I uh, did global health, took me to post-genocide Rwanda and other places around the globe. Uh, worked at OSU doing that, and then I ended up at the Columbus Foundation, wh which is a great place to try to create the community conditions in which we can all flourish, because you can bring multiple systems around the table. And, th and then I got that call, and the rest you sort of all may have seen uh, unfold. Um, there are three things I want to share from from lessons learned from communicating. Many, many people are studying what we did in Ohio. And I want to say there's no order that could have saved lives. Those were just like these stakes in the ground to tell people what we know. We made a promise that we would tell you what we knew when we knew it. Um, but we did when we realized the feds, and I was in the White House last week of February with Mick Mulvaney, the president's chief of staff, begging him to tell the president, this is the higher angels moment. This is the FDR, Winston Churchill. Like, we're at war, but we have a common enemy. Like, everyone in the world has the same enemy. I always thought if aliens invaded from outer space, we'd be on the same team finally. So that's the moment that was what at hand. Came back, the governor and I made that promise. The scientists had gone underground. The best people came out of the woodwork. The second we did the first thing, which was telling the truth. We were so brutally honest. We put those stakes in the ground. You could not legislate your way out of the myriad of problems, the hunger games of PPE, you know, not enough ventilators, all the kinds of problems we were solving um, and that everyone solved. But by telling the truth, the best people in the world came to us who had gone underground. And telling the truth came from my childhood. I'm one of those people who like the cards on the table. I think people can take the truth because that's where you begin to solve things. That's when you can think outside the box. And, and so that truth is something I think leaders and all of us are leaders. We're all called to things. You know, I'm not talking the truth where you tell your boss everything you're thinking every day and get in trouble, right? You know, use some judgment, right? Right? I know it's hard. It's hard. Use some judgment. I haven't sometimes. But, but, but that truth um, really does set you free. It gives me hope. You know, ugly things do not scare me. But hope, the thing we're talking about moving forward with, is optimism with a plan. So you need the plan part, and that means you got to gather everyone around the table with that honest assessment and work from there, and don't be afraid of it. The second thing was vulnerability. They said we were very vulnerable. On air, it's true. I want to tell you the hate was real. It was dangerous. You know, the same people who wanted to get Gretchen Whitmer also were coming, you know, planning uh, for the governor and I, safe houses, you know, executive protection, the whole thing. That said, because that's clickable stuff, the love 
was so much greater than the hate. So much greater. People in Ohio rode. We literally did flatten the curve. And like I said, it wasn't my orders. It was what people did for one another all over the state. I have so many stories I wish I could share with you if we had more time of what people did. One, I'll tell you, Bonnie Bowen, 90-some years old, did watercolors every day as part of a Facebook group, little whimsical paintings. Then she got covid And she was met with hundreds of thousands of prayer messages from around the world, and she got through COVID. And that's the kind of give and take I saw happening everywhere. I hear stories about it everywhere I go. Other countries followed us. Businesses ran, you know, 48 states of business based on Ohio. We were rowing, and and we really did. When you look at the data, you see we started on a very different trajectory. Finally, the last thing we did was empowerment. And so I want to talk a little bit about calls to action. That's the one I was most conscious of. I asked folks, please, you know, help your neighbor who's a nurse's child. Watch that child while she does the double shift. Check on the elderly person. How about the kid who's not in school? And Ohioans did that for one another. We are not done. This pandemic really is not done with us because we have yet to really name everything we've experienced. Um, We haven't had a post-mortem sort of 9-11 style look at this. It's almost too much for us to realize that we've had more loss of life um, than all wars combined, all disasters combined in modern history. And letting in the disruption and the chaos hurts. So we've moved on. We're like trying to get back to it. But there will be a time soon where we will pause. We will need to mourn what we've lost, because that's what will really set us free to move forward. We will have to memorialize this, like you'll see monuments and things become, come to be. But the biggest thing is we'll make meaning out of all we've endured. Last thing I'll say, because I really want to say this to young people, I'm so excited about this generation. I think of you as COVID, like, but I, I think you as Generation C. I know you have another alphabet letter, right? But not for the chaos. We talk a lot about the chaos and the challenges. But this generation and every generation is tasked with co-creating the world we want to live in. And they're different. Everywhere I go, I've done a lot of commencement addresses. They are collaborators. They are change agents. They care. They're compassionate. They have hard conversations. They're willing to make space, to create holding spaces for hard conversations. They make connections. Connections and relationships are what we need to reweave our fabric. They said during 2020 there was a study of um, bipartisan look that said that we might be at the founding, the fourth founding of our country right now. We had the beginning of our country. We had Reconstruction. We went through the Civil Rights era. And that something is happening now. We can't deny there's so much changing in the world. But right in the middle of those crises, you can go backwards, and we have at times. It's also the greatest opportunity for change. Right in the middle of disruption is the greatest opportunity to reimagine what is possible. So our task is to kind of build the community we want to live in and the world, and all of us will get called in one way or another. There'll be that moment where you just can't look the other way, and you'll want to, but lean into it and tell your story and tell your truth. So thank you to all of you who served. You helped save my life as a child, and to the young people out there. Those experiences will give you superpowers when the going gets tough. So thank you so much. Thank you. Well, good morning. 
I was telling my table mates, you, you normally don't want to go after a keynote speaker. <laughs> Dr. Acton, thank you so much. Um, I have to get myself together because I usually take on a lot of emotion, and that was very, very powerful. Um, I'm Tanya McClanahan. I'm the Director of Inclusion and Analysis here at Franklin County Children's Services, and I'm joined this morning by Chuck Cochran, our College-Bound Mentoring Program Coordinator. Let's take a moment again to thank Dr. Acton for those powerful, inspiring <laughs> Now we get to hear some of the powerful stories of our youth, our families, our staff, and partners. Let's begin with honoring several of our teens with scholarships before they head off to college and on to their futures. And what better way to do that than by hearing from them in their own words? Hi, my name is Anaya Ballard, and um, I'm 18 years old, and I go to West High School. My future goal is to become a dental hygienist, and to help with that, I'm going to Columbus State, and someone who helps me with all my goals is my mom. Hi, my name is Benji. I am 17. I will be 18 in April. I currently go to Art and College Preparatory Academy, or ACPA. Um, I plan to go to Kent State for the nursing. And someone who helps me attain my goals, I would say, is my current foster mom. Um, I don't think I would be here today if I didn't live here. Hi, my name is Chantel Taylor, and I am 18 years old, and I attend Columbus Iota. And one of my goals is to graduate high school and to be accepted into Paul Mitchell and to own my own makeup business. And the people that will help me attend those goals is Miss Hatton, Renegar, Miss George, and Miss Kelly Jackson, and Miss Manorino. Hi, my name is Najee Haley. I am 18 years old. I currently attend Pickerington Central. My future plan is to be a successful carpenter and to make a long career out of my job. And I'm going to get there by putting in effort and doing the best I can to achieve my goals. And the people that help me achieve my goals is my foster parents and Mr. Orion and my uh, caseworker and the whole FCCH. Hi, my name is Jaden Priest. I'm 20 years old and I graduated from Flex High School in 2020 when I was 16. I've reached out to Ohio State's beauty school admissions and I plan to enroll there in August. My plans for the future are to become a certified lash technician and opening my own business within that. I can get there by getting my esthetician license and maybe learning more about business. My grandma and grandpa have been my biggest support systems throughout my whole entire life. They've been there through the biggest moments and the littlest moments. Hello, my name is Jenna Mickens. I am 17 and I currently go to Gahanna Lincoln High School. Uh, my plans for the future currently are going to Hawking College for equine teaching and training. One person that has helped me reach my goal is Megan. She is a worker at Dreams on Horseback. My name is Riley Wilson. I'm 17 years old. I attend Bexley High School. My plans are to graduate from Bexley High School and then go on to Bowling Green State University. I have so many people who have helped me along my way. Um, but Maggie Baxter, my foster mom, helped me the most. Hello everyone, my name is Mia Woods. I'm 17 years old and I currently attend Reynoldsburg High School. My plans for the future are to attend Capital University and major in psychology or preferably vet tech or vet assistant because of my love for animals. Someone who inspires me is my foster mom, Miss Betty. She has always been there for me, always believed in me. She's the big inspiration in my life. She is the example if, if you want something, you go get it and you put your mind to it, you can have it. Good morning. We'll begin today with awarding the Jack Donahue College Scholarships. These are named in honor of our former executive deputy director. The first award is a $4,000 a year for four consecutive years. The second Donahue Scholarship is a $4,000 a year for two consecutive years. Our two 
Donahue scholarship recipients for this year are Jamie Elizabeth Huddleston and Jenna Mickens. Let's give both of these young women a round of applause. Each year, FCCS awards $1,000 scholarships for four consecutive years to students ready for the next step in post-graduation. This year, we have eight recipients of our merit scholarships. Please stand and be recognized as your name appears on the screen. Okay. Anya Ballard. Hope Maynard, if you could please stand. Kamir Williams. Ladia Griggs. Marcella Dorsey. Peyton Roth. Benji Castrogene. Chantel Taylor. And one more. We are also honored to award the Alvin Haley College Scholarship presented every year to one FCCS youth working towards a bachelor's degree. Please help me invite to the stage to celebrate this year's honoree, Riley Wilson. I'm just going to say thank you, and I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning. I too am still gathering myself after a great speaker and also after all of our young people here. It's really uh, an honor today to, to see all of you and to know the path that you're going on and where you're going to be in a few years. It's really amazing. So good job. I'm Tina Rutherford, the agency's deputy director. Two years ago, we lost a loyal board member, Douglas Moore, uh, who we miss dearly. He served for 16 years on our board. He will be remembered for speaking his mind, championing the rights of bargaining unit staff, and he also had a huge heart and cared deeply for the success of the young people we serve and the families we serve. In his honor, we established a special scholarship for graduates seeking a vocational and a trade school future. I'm happy to announce the first two winners of this special scholarship who will receive $4,000 a year for two years to pursue their careers. Help me welcome to the stage our first honoree, Najee Haley. a few words today, huh? <laughs> Our second uh, scholarship winner is Jaden Priest. Please come to the stage. Thank you. Thank you and congratulations. Good morning. It seems like we're all gathering ourselves. I'm just happy I didn't trip on the way up here, so I'm doing pretty good right now. My name is Dan Shook. 
I am the Chief Financial Officer at Franklin County Children's Services, and I am absolutely blessed to be here. It is my pleasure to thank one of our great community partners, the CME Federal Credit Union, for always investing in the future of a deserving FCCF youth. Would representatives of the CME Federal Credit Union please stand and be recognized? Thank you, thank you. Thank you for investing in our youth. This year, the CME scholarship was increased to to $2,000 thanks to an extra donation by a Columbus firefighter, by the Columbus Firefighter Foundation. So thank you, firefighters. The fifth annual CME scholarship goes to a young woman who has been accepted at two colleges, including our host college at Columbus State. Please help me congratulate Miara Woods. <laughs> Accepting on behalf of Miara. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> congratulations. Uh, hopefully I got her name right. Congratulations, Miara. everyone. My name is Cassie Snyder. I am the Associate Director of Adoptions and Youth Transition Services at Franklin County Children's Services. The Rising Up and Moving On Award acknowledges youth in our care who have overcome difficult circumstances on their way to success. Let's hear it for our first award recipient, Riley Wilson. My name is Ebony Giddens. I am Riley's caseworker. Um, she became involved in SCCS a few years ago. Um, we, At this point, we have her in custody and she remains involved with the agency. Some of the challenges that Riley has faced is being involved with SCCS, which is a challenge in itself, um, having to be in separate placements from her sisters, having to move placements, and then acclimate from kinship care to foster care. Despite her challenges, she has achieved academic success in school. She will be receiving a four-year scholarship from Franklin County Children's Services, and she is receiving the Rise Up Award. Riley should be recognized as the Rising Up and Moving On Award winner because of her resilience. Throughout all the challenges she has faced, she has never let that stop her. She continues to fight. She has continued to be a sweet, caring, passionate person through everything she has gone through. She loves and cares so much about her family and her sisters. Over the past year and a half, I have really watched her come out of her comfort zone and do things that make her uncomfortable, but it has proven that it has pushed her to succeed even more, and I think she is very deserving of this award. My name is Riley Wilson, and I've been able to succeed through all the trauma I've gone through, and like keeping up with everything and keeping my personality and my kindness to everyone the same, even though I went through very hard times and it could usually change a person, yet it made me stronger than I thought I could ever be. My plans for the future is to go to Bowling Green graduate from there, become a veterinarian, get my life together a bit more, get a decent place, be able to help my sisters out because that is what is most important to me. Congratulations, Riley. Now let's hear it for our second Rising Up and Moving On Award recipient, Liliana Garcia. Charlotte McDougall. I became involved with the family as the previous caseworker. Um, I worked with Liliana for about four to five years and we became with the, involved with the family um, due to some ongoing concerns. This is around a time where she had been through a lot of trauma and she just wanted to make a new start. I know that Liliana um, has been able to graduate high school, which was a big accomplishment for her. Um, she's currently living on her own and able to provide for her own basic needs, which is a big thing for her. 
That's something that she has always wanted to do since I met her as a caseworker. I had the help of my foster mom, who was there for me throughout everything. She, uh, even now, still maintains contact, maintains contact with me, helps me out here and there. And then I had the help of a friend of mine who made sure I was taken care of outside of what my foster mom did for me. I had the help of my caseworker, who was wonderful. She talked to me constantly. She uh, reassured me of any difficulties that I was going through. She was always there when I needed her, and um, I appreciate her a lot for that. Liliana is a smart, very strong woman. Um, she's overcame so many different traumas in her life, and you know, at such a young age, she's been able to overcome those and you know, be able to provide for herself and be on her own. And that's something that she has always worked hard for. Um, and you can really tell that if she puts her mind to it, that she can accomplish that. She has triumphed through all of the obstacles that was thrown her way. Um, and she has done it with such grace and strength um, without giving up. My plans at the moment are to uh, get my license within the next year, and then I want to hopefully go to trade school to begin welding. I am going to ask Liliana to join me on the stage for another round of applause and to say a few words. You're fine. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very honored to be here. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Katie Smith, and Nancy Fitzgibbons was my mom. Like many of you, she was a Franklin County Children's Services caseworker. Um, I and my family, including my sister, Mary Waters, who's here today, appreciate being part of the FC FCCS family. Um, Children's Services created the Child Protection Award in our mother's name to honor her and her lasting legacy as a dedicated child welfare professional. Um, it's a job she held for only a couple of years before her death. Um, my mom was a secretary at the Columbus Jewish Federation while going to college on the weekends at Ohio Dominican. She told a professor there that she was going to do whatever it took to earn her degree in social work. I watched her study for 10 years on the weekends while raising us kids, um, including my brother who has autism. It did not look easy, and I'm sure that I didn't appreciate what she was doing nearly enough as a bratty teenager. Um, she earned a lot of A's at college during those times, and then in her early 50s, she experienced a transformation in her career and in her life because she realized her dream of um, becoming a social worker, and she joined FCCS as a, as a caseworker. As you know, um, tragically, she was killed during a home visit in October 2001, so that wasn't the ending to, the, to her story that we imagined at all. But we keep her memory alive. Her story is not over. Um, by recognizing staff here at FCCS who go above and beyond expectations in their roles as child welfare caseworkers. Um, I'm joined on this on this stage here by Jesse and, and Catherine. Um, sorry, I. Jesse Lucer and Catherine Chiraldi, who I believe are, are, you work with these people who are about to be honored. And so um, we're going to hear from, from them now. Um, we're going to hear from this year's first Child Protection Award recipient um, from the ongoing case management team, and that's Miss Abby Siebert. My name's Abby, um, and I'm an ongoing caseworker. I chose to become a caseworker because I um, have a passion for working with children, 
and working in the community. Um, all my previous work experiences before have been serving the community, so um, for me, it's very personal um, to continue working in the skills. Abby's approach to child welfare makes a difference to the children and families she serves because she is so compassionate, empathetic, and understanding of everyone's situation. Um, she goes in very non-biased, um, not judgmental, just literally there to learn uh, what their challenges are, any barriers they're facing, and how she can help them get through that. What inspires me to continue my role would be knowing that a lot of time I'm the child advocate, um, I'm their support system, um, those happy, positive stories where a mother's achieved her sobriety or, or dad, um, just being the support system to them and um, yeah, just continuing to happy as my why. Um, and she does a great job at that. Abby always goes in with fresh eyes and makes her own assessment. She doesn't depend on others' um, assessments. She gives everyone a fresh start and a fair chance. And I think that that's important and that's what makes her stand out in this job. She is so supportive and just pours so much into her families and children, as well as her colleagues, and I think that they're, we are all really grateful for you and what you do to, to help the community and your case work, or your colleagues. Many congrats to Abby Seifert. Please come up. Um, I didn't really have a speech plan, so um, I am honored to receive this. Um, and it is not, for me, it's more of a, a team effort. I couldn't have done it without my wonderful team um, and then even everyone else at the agency working with such a supportive team has been um, what I love about this job and what I feel like makes me successful in it. So thank you guys. And now we'll present the second Child Protection Award, and it is to an intake department caseworker who also goes above and beyond expectations, and that person is Scott Demange. My name is Scott Demange. Uh, I became a caseworker out of college back in 2004. Scott has been a intake caseworker for over 10 years. Part of his job is that he receives uh, referrals for abuse, neglect, and dependency. He quickly has to uh, read history about families, um, contact the family, and assess these allegations while engaging the family and documenting and dealing with any crisis or emergency that might come up. Uh, what inspires me to continue in my role is, is the people I work with, whether it be my coworkers, the families I work with, I love helping kids. I love meeting new people every day. It's a fast-paced job. No day is ever the same. So I love just everything about it. Franklin County is a great place to work with, uh, work at, work with people that I love coming to work. So that's really what inspires me to keep on going is, is the great support that I have here and, and helping out families. I love, I love it. Scott also just kind of um, unofficially performs like a mentor, like a leader for intake for within his unit and actually the whole department. I'm content on being a caseworker as long as they let me be up until <laughs> I retire. So there's really no set goal I have in mind except for continuing to work here and work with everyone around me. Congrats, Scott. Please join us. I actually do have a speech plan, uh, so 
Um, you know, it's an honor to be here. Um, I, I've never spoken in front of this many people before. In fact, when my son saw the way I was dressed, he asked if I was going golfing today. So um, I'll just pretend I'm on the golf course and be comfortable out there. So um, this award's possible. As, as everyone said, it's a, it's a team effort. And at FCCS, we stress working together for the safety of the kids and our families and our motto, uh, protecting children while strengthening families. So I'd like to take this time to thank a bunch of people that have helped me throughout my career here. Uh, first off, actually, I'd like to thank uh, Chip Spenning. Um, as you saw in the video, I started my caseworker career at a college at Greene County Children's Services in 2004. And I met my now wife, Laura, in 2006, and we wanted to move to Columbus. And I wanted to continue with Children's Services, but I was too nervous to come to Franklin County Children's Services. I, I didn't feel that I was ready for the top. I mean, Franklin County Children's Services, the major leagues. And so on a whim, I went to Madison County Children's Services, and that's where I met Chip, who was the director there, and Robin Bruno, who's now the director. And they must have seen something in me because they offered me a job. And it was a job that didn't even exist. They had to go to the directors and the board and convince them during a recession to add a position at, at Madison County Children's Services. So without them, I don't know if I would have continued down that field. Um, so thank you, Chip and Robin, for believing in me then and believing in me now. Uh, I'd like to thank all the intake directors, Laura LaRoche, Emily Green, and even Pittsburgh Steeler fan Catherine <laughs> over here. Uh, they're really uh, instrumental because they have open door policies. They talk to us. They have luncheons. They take our ideas seriously and they change um, policies and they they always make sure that we're listened to and that's really supportive. So thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the legal department, Julie, Susan Pegg, the uh, CLUs, and the placement kinship team, Amy, Jeanette, Renee, Melissa, everyone. Um, Removing and placing a child is the most difficult part of our job. Uh, it's stressful, it's time consuming and emotional. And these departments help us because they know we're doing 50 things at once and they're quick to help out and never once do they email and say, Scott, you've been here forever, you should know how to do this. But they're, they're quick to help and um, they make that process as easy as possible even though it's the most hurtful and, and, and stressful part of our job, so thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the community service service workers, the uh, service aides, the provider services, everyone, they do the grunt work. They, they help pay bills. They go grocery shopping. They give us supplies. And it's those little things that help us focus on assessments and we could help them. So thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank all the associate directors that uh, I've worked with, especially my direct one, Andy Buss. And he, like everyone else, uh, he's there for us. He has an open door policy. He's a shoulder to cry on when the Bengals lose. It's, it's, he's <laughs> always listening to us and he's always putting us first and making sure that we're always there. I'd like to thank my team bus, the supervisors, Beata, Jewel, Alicia, Chattel, floating supervisors, all my coworkers who I can't name here. Uh, we work together. We are there for our families. We go on visits for each other and we always work together as a team. So thank you. I'd like to thank my direct supervisor, Lisa Fisher, who's been my supervisor since day one. Um, she's the best supervisor you could ask for. She's supportive. She's diligent in her work. Um, she listens and guides us. Um, she always makes sure that we put our families first, but also take time for ourselves. And it's, she's always supportive in that way. Lastly, I'd like to thank my wife, Lauren's son, Connor. Um, Laura's the queen of scheduling. She works in Chillicothe and still manages to be able to pick up Connor when I have late visits. Connor's there to give me a hug after long days, play board games with me, and without them, I wouldn't be able to do this, so thank you. Um, in conclusion, uh, thank you for this award. I didn't have the, the pleasure of knowing Nancy, but her memory does live on in, in the walls of FCCS, and it's an honor to have my name next to hers, and I hope I can continue working in her honor in this community. So thank you.
Good morning. I'm Raquel Breckenridge, and I oversee our family services and a permanency division here at the agency. When youth must leave home, Children's Services looks to grandparents, aunts, uncles, other relatives, and close family friends to step in as caregivers. Today, we like to honor one of those kinship caregivers. Take a listen. Hi, I'm Samantha Nader. I'm a Padina Adams um, caseworker. She is my kinship provider for the children. Um, she helped us out by um, taking the two boys because mom was having some difficulties with things and she's been awesome with um, taking care of them. Some of the challenges that Miss per Perdina Adams has faced is just getting the boys on a regular schedule, um, helping them with their homework, getting them tutoring so that way they can get their grades up to where they need to be, trying to get a cohesive schedule with them to get to school, um, get them the help that they need through tutoring. She has been reading with them when they come home and do their homework. And the boys' whose ages are 12 and 7. Um, Ms. Padina Adams has, you know, worked with the boys and got their grades up. It's, you know, just a total turnaround from when they first came to her. Now they are more like loving and caring and they love to go see mom and they're waiting for us to say it's okay to go back to mom because they're so excited when they see mom. Um, Ms. Perdina Adams has like done so much work with them. Um, she's so excited to get them with their grades up. Um, she is excited when they go and see mom because they're so happy to see mom and she encourages them to you know keep the positive attitude and would love um, everything to work out and mom be able to take the boys back. She loves them very much, but she wants them to go back to mom. <laughs> Congratulations to Bradina Adams, recipient of the Kinship Appreciation Award. Miss Adams, is Miss Adams here? No, oh, if you can come on up. Would you like to say something? Thank you to everybody, especially a special thank you to Beth Earl and Miss Sam. Thank you. Our next award honors at least one family each year who have strengthened their families through hard work and dedication. This year we are pleased to bestow our Family Achievement Award to Gary and Caitlin Kleinpast. Um, well, my name is Gary and this is Caitlin. We've been foster parents for about eight years. I've had the pleasure of knowing Gary and Caitlin for the last um, two years now. They are licensed foster parents through the Bear Foundation um, and over the last seven and a half years they have been a safe haven for sibling groups. Um, they currently have two separate sibling groups which is a total of five children in their home. Uh, they are a treatment foster home, so they take in children with a little bit more significant needs than uh, typical kids. When Gary and I started dating, we talked about fostering, and it was really great to find out that there was someone else who was on the same page as I was, so this was a, a big part of what we wanted to do with our lives. Yeah. It takes. Um, a lot of uh, time and consideration and research and trial and error to yeah. work with each kid so that you get them into a situation where they their needs are being met. They do everything that they can to provide these children and their families, their biological families, with grace, empathy, and room to heal. When we are able to see kids making breakthroughs and 
growing and developing, it is amazing and it's the best thing in the world. Congratulations to Gary and Caitlin, and if you'd like to come up and say a few words. Hi. Uh, honestly, this just wouldn't be possible without uh, just the support of everyone around us, just all the people here at FCCS, but also in particular the caseworkers that we've been working with. Uh, Maggie, who you saw in the video and I think is over there. Hi, Maggie. Um, as well as Sarita and uh, Ashley. Um. And yeah, and we just, we have an amazing team of people who mm -hmm. support us and who make everything possible. Yeah. Um, from CASA, we have an amazing CASA, Stephanie, for some of our kids, and mm -hmm. the Bear Foundation and our families. My parents are here. They live around the corner, and they are our go-to people. They're amazing. Yeah. Uh, um, also, my brothers have been really helpful, if nothing else, just for me to vent about parenting because they're also parents. <laughs> and I'm sure that all of you know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. Yeah. We just thank you all so much mm -hmm. for everything you do. Yeah. 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 I love these breakfasts. I mean, they just fill you up and set you up for coming through the year. The incredible staff and families and youth and community partners. It's awesome. Uh, it's, it's my honor to give out our Community Advocate Awards. They recognize impressive people and generous organizations that go above and beyond to help children and families in Franklin County. We depend upon the support of the community, and we value the relationships with our partners. And today, we're delighted to present two Community Advocate Awards. So let's hear more about the first winner, the uh, Junior League of Columbus. The Junior League is uh, involved with the agency. Initially started with a conversation uh, with my coworker, Chuck Cochran, and my associate director, Cassie Snyder, they reached out to the Junior League about a partnership with the agency. And when they decided that they wanted to be a part of it, they decided that they wanted to do something different. Our community projects include the Kelton House Museum and Garden, which is a Victorian era home and now operates as a museum and used to be a stop on the Underground Railroad and also our Bridging the Gap program, um, which supports youth aging out of foster care. So the Junior League of Columbus is able to provide Franklin County's children's services, apartments and a suitcase at the end of the year during graduations. This is a, a great program for us where we provide dishes, towels, bath mats, kitchen equipment, all in a suitcase for the youth graduating. And then over the course of the year, we partner on a Tuesday night for the life skills classes. These classes help teach anything from banking to housing um, to how to get an interview and how to act during an interview as well. To me, to be able to help the children through Franklin County Children's Services is deeply meaningful. Um, this is a great opportunity for our members to really impact the community, to be able to guide the youth, to be able to provide resources helps us to impact the community and also help a vulnerable population. I'm just thankful that they had decided to be a part of Franklin County Children's Services and the young people that we serve. I can't say how thankful I am to be a partner with them and I look forward to many, many years of them helping us and us serving our young people. And if Junior Achievement would like to come forward. Hi, 
Hi, everyone. On behalf of the Junior League of Columbus and our membership, um, this is quite the honor. And we are so lucky to be here amongst so many amazing people doing such important work in the community. Our organization um, really is focused on the transformative power of women coming together to make an impact in the community. And again, we are so honored to receive this award and to be here amongst um, some really inspirational people. So thank you so much. Congratulations to our friends at Junior League. And now let's hear our second Community Advocate Award, Shema Dada, with us together. My name is Shema Dada. I work as interpreter for us together. I work as interpreter for FCCS, helping Afghan families understanding the service offered to them, especially about the childcare, the family support. My job is to translate what the caseworkers say into Afghan families' language. Helping Afghan families, especially the kids, is very important to me. It felt great to know, and I can help them, welcome them in a safe environment. The child that I work with uh, came from Afghanistan and is placed with a relative kinship caregiver and um, they've been in the United States for several years, but she has language barriers, and that's why I need an interpreter. Shima helped navigate through the language barriers, but also the cultural issues specific to this family. Shima is always positive and upbeat. She is an advocate for the Afghan community. She cares about the family she works with. She truly has been my Afghan mentor and an ambassador to her culture, and I hope one day to team with her again. That was so sweet of you guys all. Thanks so much. Congratulations. <laughs> you really deserve this. Aww. Ms. Shem, I'd like to come forward, receive your award. We're not here. Hello everyone. I am delighted and honored to receive this award. I cannot do it without of the, such a great caseworkers. I work for FCCS for a long time. Leisure, thank you for the honor you gave it to me and thank you so much. I hope I can help in the future. Have a good day. As this concludes our breakfast, let's not forget our call to action, that we keep children safer together when we can build a hopeful future for every family in Franklin County, and we're ready to build it together. Thank you to all our presenters, our staff, our honorees. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.